All right, we're going to start with today's session on molecules of life, and this is a part of the flipped classroom that we're going to go through. My name is Dr. Farhan Cyprian. I am going to be going through this session with you today. I'm an assistant professor of immunology and cell biology at the College of Medicine, Qatar University. Now, there are four major molecules of life that are present in the body, make up all the, all the living beings, and they're started off with proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are basically of two main types, deoxyribonucleic acids and ribonucleic acids, which is the DNA and the RNA, and both of them are mainly involved in the synthesis of the proteins. Carbohydrates and lipids give rise to both structure and a main source of energy. Now, all these molecules that are there that are, the, that are found in us, of them, three exist mainly as polymers, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. And these polymers are made up of small building blocks, which are called as the monomers. So a single building block called a monomer links with another sing single building block, which is another monomer, so on and so forth, giving rise to a chain of building blocks called a polymer. Now, the polymers that are synthesized are basically synthesized by a very simplistic reaction, where a dehydration reaction, removal of water, the OH and the H, takes place between one monomeric subunit with another monomeric subunit. And when it happens, it gives rise to a covalent bond in between, increasing the length of the polymer. So a short polymer increases in size. These kind of dehydration reactions are basically facilitated by enzymes that help in speeding up these condensation or dehydration reactions. Now, this is the process of synthesis of polymers. The opposing process would be the breakdown of polymers, and that could that you can imagine is an opposite reaction, where instead of dehydration, you have hydrolysis, where basically water molecule is added, and it basically breaks down the covalent bond, giving rise to the single monomer that can be released from the larger polymeric chain. Now, each cell has thousands and different kinds of macromolecules, and these vary between the organism and species and give rise to multiple different plethora of function. The immense variety of the polymers can basically come up because different monomers can combine with each other in different formats. For example, the English language has a particular set of alphabets and they come in different combinations giving rise to language. That's similarly what happens in this case. Our focus today is going to be mainly on proteins from the rest of the molecules of life that we'll discuss later on as you continue within the year two. Now, proteins have got a plethora of functions. They, by, 50, they, by dry mass, they form 50% of the cell mass. They can be enzymes where they're, for example, digestive enzymes where they can actually give rise to the reaction by breaking down dietary proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids into their basic constituents. They can be structural in nature, such as collagen, which is a form which is needed in connective tissues as well. They can form the function of storage. That's particularly in, in the egg white, where they do that also in cases of milk. Uh, they can be transport proteins, such as hemoglobin that is involved in transport of oxygen. They can be hormones that basically signal, for example, insulin that regulates the blood glucose level released and secreted by the pancreas. They can be receptors on the surface of the cell that are responsible for signaling. They can also be the contractile and motor proteins, both inside the cell and outside the cell. Uh, in, they're both inside the cell, giving rise to functions outside the cell. For example, the actin and the myosin that contract inside the muscle give rise to the locomotion or movement of the body. Last but not the least, we have the defensive proteins where the antibodies combat bacteria and viruses. Uh, briefly, the enzymes uh, that are responsible uh, for these kind of particular reaction that we just discussed, here the enzymes are responsible for a hydrolytic reaction where they take the substrate sucrose Sucrose goes and binds to the enzyme on the enzyme binding site. The enzyme increases the rate of the reaction by breaking them down. And the su sucrose is broken down 
थ्रू द एडिशन ऑफ वाटर इन टू इट्स इट्स सिंपलर कॉम्पोनेंट्स फ्रक्टोस एंड ग्लूकोज देयर बाय एनजाइम्स इम्प्रूव द डाइजेस्टिव कैपेसिटी विद इन दिस विद इन अ पर्टिकुलर सेल एंड हेल्प इन ब्रेकिंग डाउन द प्रोडक्ट दैट इज देयर विदाउट दम सेल्स गोइंग थ्रू एनी पर्टिकुलर चेंज एंड इंक्रीज द रेट ऑफ रिएक्शन अपार्ट फ्रॉम एनजाइम्स यू हैव गॉट स्ट्रक्चरल प्रोटीन्स स्ट्रक्चरल प्रोटीन्स कैन बी इन साइड द सेल एंड स्ट्रक्चरल प्रोटीन्स कैन बी आउटसाइड द सेल and both of them help in forming the shape of the cell in so the cell structural proteins inside help in forming the shape of the cell from the inside whereas those on the outside help the cell to anchor to them in addition the intracellular structural proteins also act as rails or pathways on which motor proteins can transport different kind of macromolecules or organelles transport proteins that are present within the cell act as uh, act as barriers act in the areas of barriers where they allow the movement of particular molecules across them towards the inside of the cell and in doing so they are selectively allowing particular molecules to move in and not allowing other molecules to do that in addition you can have you can have uh, proteins that function as hormone receptors in this particular case we have the example of insulin which will come and bind to the cell surface protein release an intracellular signaling molecule and this signaling molecule will go and act on the cell to increase the uptake of glucose right so hormones can signal to the cell as well and not only the hormone itself is a protein but the receptor on which the hormones act are also proteins you can have defensive proteins such as antibodies and the main function of the antibodies in this particular case is to go and bind the pathogen these antibodies are released by the b cells they will go and bind to the virus and thereby destroy it you can have proteins such as storage proteins these storage proteins are have a particular importance by which when required these storage proteins can be broken down into their individual constituents which are basically your amino acids and these amino acids can then be used by the cell for making different kind of structural proteins now going back to these amino acids what are these amino acids amino acids are basically structures where which make proteins they have the basic building block of proteins there are 20 different amino acids and you call them amino acids because to the central alpha carbon you have an amino group attached and you have a carboxylic group attached therefore the term amino acid so all amino amino acids will have an amine group and a carboxylic acid group apart from that the third bonding that the carbon has is with the h and the fourth is with an r group the r group can be anything and the r group is something that basically determines the main structural outcome of the different kinds of uh, amino acids and therefore it confers these different amino acids different kinds of properties for example the amino acids the r group of the amino of this particular amino acid these they could be nonpolar r groups and therefore these amino acids are termed as nonpolar amino acids the example is glycine where the r group is just an just a hydrogen you have alanine with the r group is just a methyl group and so on and so forth with valine leucine isoleucine methionine phenylalanine with tryptophan and proline so all of them categorize them in, into the nonpolar amino acids now when the, where you see nonpolar amino acids you can obviously just guess that you would have amino acids that are polar in nature by polarity we mean that the different constituents that are there in terms of the oxygen it or the sulf hydryl group it would make a pull on the electron cloud around it and give rise to the polarity in this we have serine threonine cysteine tyrosine aspartame and glutamine and we have the amino acids that can give away the proton and these are the aspartic acid and glutamic acid and therefore are acidic amino acids or who can receive a proton such as lysine arginine histidine which basically become positively charged and therefore are called basic amino acids now these amino acids 
How do they give rise to polymerization? Is just like any polymers that form where you have a dehydration reaction taking place where the hydrogen from the N terminus and the hydroxyl from the carboxylic acid group is taken and water is removed. When in this process it gives rise to the formation of a covalent bond which is called the peptide bond. Now this sequence that is formed gives rise to what you call as a backbone whereas this the R groups give rise to the formation of the side chains uh, and the amino acids keep adding moving from the N terminus to the C terminus of the polypeptide chain. So that's how the chains primarily elongate. Based on these kind of based on the sequence of the amino acids the proteins can actually fold into go through many twists and coils to form a very unique shape and that is very important for the structure of the protein. Here is an example of lysozyme where a groove is formed within it. Another example that we are showing over here is that of an antibody where the unique shape of folding of the tip of the antibody acts as a lock and key mechanism by which it will go and bind precisely to the protein from flu virus and thereby therefore identify it and help in the destruction of the virus. Now proteins go through many different structures that are uh, that are identified. The primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary and the quaternary structure. The primary structure is primarily identified by its genetic uh, sequence of the amino acids which gives rise to the primary shape. So each amino acid which is added on to the other amino acid gives rise to the sequence of the amino acids within a polypeptide chain that governs, that governs its primary structure. Now the primary structure starts off from the N terminus going all the way up to the C terminus and these primary uh, structure amino acids between them as we studied earlier give rise to the uh, polypeptide uh, chain and within them they have the backbone formed by the core proteins. The R groups are almost always positioned more outwardly and based on the kind of R groups of the 20 different amino acids it can give rise to different kind of shapes which is determined more by the tertiary, uh, the tertiary structure. Now the primary structure itself is basically See, simply the sequence in which the amino acids are being generated. The secondary structure base is an outcome of the coils and folds resulting from the hydrogen bonds between the repeating constituents of the polypeptide backbone. Remember, the secondary structure is an outcome of the backbone hydrogen bonding. Okay, It can manifest itself or come as either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet between the two chains that are running parallel to each other or within a single chain that is being coiled up on itself. The secondary structure therefore uh, in this example what we're going through is that of the helix that is around the forming around the backbone and if you notice on the sides over here you have all the R groups that are formed. So the secondary structure is not an outcome of the R groups but it is an intrinsic property of the sequence of the amino acids and how they coil around forming uh, structures like alpha helices or the beta pleated sheets. Now the tertiary structure of the amino acids is mainly an outcome of the R groups and how these R groups interact with each other. They can have simple hydrophobic van der Waal interactions, they can have hydrogen bonds, ionic bond or even covalent bond to disulfide bridges. And this tertiary structure that is formed is above the secondary structure which is the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets where the different kinds of uh, 
amino, amino acids are gross when they come into close proximity with, with each other can give rise can give rise to different outcomes for example you can have a basic and an acidic amino acid coming in and giving rise to an ionic bond between them you can have polar forces that come in and give rise to the hydrogen bonds in between two chains or you can give rise to hydrogen bonding that can be with the water which is surrounding this particular protein in addition you can have bondings that come up due to covalent bondings due to the disulfide bridges now the tertiary structure is of a single pep polypeptide chain and when many different polypeptide chains come together they can give rise to what you call as a quaternary structure here we have the example of collagen which is three three polypeptide chains coming together giving rise to a rope kind of a network and you have the hemoglobin where you have two alpha chains and two beta chains giving rise to the structure of a hemoglobin molecule notice that in between them also between these single polypeptide chains you will have interactions like van der waal forces hydrogen bonds and others to keep the these chains together now the example we can go through of the impact of a primary structure on the quaternary structure is that of a sickle cell disease which is an inherited it's a genetically inherited blood disorder where the dna sequence is mutated and because of that it gives rise to a single amino acid substitution in the protein of hemoglobin where a normal red blood cell becomes a sickle red blood cell how does that happen is that the primary structure in a normal hemoglobin molecule gives rise to a normal beta uh, globin subunit and normal rbc shape ensues on account of that however the sixth amino acid is mutated due to the genetic changes where valine substitutes it and this valine gives rise to a change in the quaternary in the tertiary structure of the protein giving rise to a kink in it this tertiary structure gives rise to a quaternary structure of the protein and in decreased oxygen environments it allows the hemo the hemoglobin molecules the sickled hemoglobin molecules come close to each other when they come very close to each other they basically end up giving rise to clustered binding with each other interaction with each other this gives rise to many many hemoglobin molecules suddenly binding to each other and collapsing and forming a clump this clumping of hemoglobin gives rise to the sickle cell shape uh, of the rbc and therefore uh, comes up as a sickle cell anemia disorder now knowing that most of the amino acids that we have have r groups which could be polar non polar etc they could all be influenced by their by the environmental factors such as ph salt concentration temperature and others to change the shape of the protein the denaturation is basically the loss in the shape of the normal protein to make another complex shape of the protein and the renaturation is going back to its original shape this is typically this can be typically seen when you for example increase the temperature the temperature will break the bonds within the secondary and the tertiary structure of this particular polypeptide chain and give rise to formation of new bonds that will denature